start this morning by reminding us why we take an hour every Sunday to talk about money and to talk about financial health. Why, why are we doing this? Are we together? Are we together? Yeah. So let's zoom out for a minute and look at the bigger picture. The Bible says, one of my favorite verses is, in one, is 3 John 1, 2, which says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things. Somebody say, in all things. And be in health just as your soul prospers. Right? So, I know that you, some of you who are, are, are good Bible scholars will say, yeah, but that is John's words to Gaius. I know. But that is the heart of God. The God, God's heart is that we prosper in everything. In everything. Marvin, just use, just stay on this PowerPoint. Don't worry about the scriptures. These guys have Bibles in their hands. I see them. Yeah? So God does not do lopsided. Lopsided means one part is stronger than the other. One, one side of you is compensating for the rest. God doesn't do lopsided. That's not his perfect will. His perfect will is that you are blessed in every area. Yeah? And the enemy, because the enemy's task is to steal, kill, destroy, what the enemy's plan is, is that he makes sure that there is a side that is having to compensate because there's a weak side. So that's why we do these services, because we, we know that traditionally the church tends to be weak in the area of financial management. But tell your neighbor, not in this house. Yeah. We have, to, we have to strengthen ourselves financially and look at all areas of our lives. So, today, we are taking a detour from SS, SFFG. I find that thing so hard to say. Straightforward Financial Growth, the book that we've been studying. And we are taking a moment to cast our eyes into the future. For some of you, it's way into the future. For some of us, the future is like here. <laughs> um, yeah, way into the future. When you are older, perhaps more frail. Those of you who are full of faith are like, I will never be frail. Okay, when you are less athletic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, there are very few certainties about life. There, there are very few things that are certain in life. Very few. One of those things, which is a hundred percent, is that tomorrow you will be older than you are today. That one is a hundred percent. I don't care what you try to do, whether you use oil of you lay or whatever, you will be older. Yeah, there is no way that you'll get younger. You tell your neighbor, you are growing older. Yes, you are growing older. Um, I remember that my mom, my grandmother, because you know when you're little, your grandmother is so old. So um, my grandmother used to say, when we would say to her, Granny, you're so old, we should say something that sounded so much like their generation, would say, you're so old. And she always used to say, that's where you're coming. Nobody goes backwards. <laughs> so I learned it from a long time ago that no one goes backwards. You are getting older. Now the issue is, we do not plan for when we are older. It, it almost takes us by surprise. Very little of our lives is dedicated for planning for when you're older. Let me read you some stats. The, this sta st I think that was statue of aging, the State of Aging Report 2023 data shows that current retirees and future generations are struggling financially. 
people aged between 60 to 64 now have the highest relative poverty at 25%. Tell your neighbor, not me. The truth is, there is such a thing as age poverty. Mm. The poorest 20% of retirees, and I assure you, at some point in your life, you will be a retiree. The poorest 20% have annual incomes below the minimum needed to live on. Do you know how much they live on? The poorest. 41 pounds per week. 41 pounds per week, and you spent that on Amazon. And overall pension poverty is on the rise. And it has risen to nearly 80, 18%, which is the highest this century. Okay? So, um, people aged between 60 to 64 have the highest poverty levels among all adults. Trends suggest millions will continue struggling when they do retire. Over one million pensioners have no savings. Over four point million people aged 50 plus have mortgages. It is relevant because if you have a mortgage at 50 plus, the likelihood is by the time you retire, you'll still have a mortgage. And if you're earning 41 pounds a week, some, the math is not going to work. Um, nearly 2 million of the elder, uh, people aged 50 plus are still renting. Mm. And with over a third of those living in poverty. All of this is because we do not plan for older age, even though we are 100% sure that we'll get there someday. Mommy, don't look at me so sad. <laughs> and it seems to me that the older you get, the quicker time moves. Has anyone ever noticed that? Do you remember that time when you used to say your age with a half? I'm nine and a half. Because you're looking forward to being 10. Now when they ask us our 10, you, you revert to the lowest zero. So I'm in my 50s. <laughs> Someone has understood. Hmm? We only count zeros. We don't, we don't put the digit. Even when you're 59, you're in your 50s. We're like, we don't, you know, like, time just goes so quickly. And then you, it's January and it's December before you know what. So I'm, I'm here really standing here to say we must plan. We must plan. Tell your, ask your neighbor for me, what is your plan? What is your plan? You know the saying, if we fail to plan... We plan to fail. There's a good quote that I got from Pastor M from Mavuno Church. He says, with finances, failing to plan is in almost all situations planning to fail. It does not matter how much one earns, but rather what they do with it. I think I'm on slide like number three. Yeah. It is possible to earn a lot of money but in old age, have nothing to show for it. Yeah. Budgeting and planning ahead is therefore very crucial for a family's well-being. It is crucial. One of the things that I found shocking when I went to Mavuno Church. Now, Mavuno Church is a very young church. The average age of the congregation, what would you say, Pastor Lincoln? Maybe 25, maybe 30 they talk retirement planning. And I'm like, in your 20s? They, they have it as part 
of their money, financial management is retiring planning. So they're all planning, building, whatever, putting money aside for when they will not be working. If we don't plan, we will fail. Let me read from the scriptures this sad story. I'll just read that one verse from 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. It says, one day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elijah, Elisha and cried out, my husband who served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. The widow of a prophet, what a shock. It says to me, even prophets can be in debt. Even prayerful people can be in debt. Even mighty man, men of God can be in prayer. So do you mean that prayer does not resolve our financial issues? I'm afraid so. As powerful as prayer is, God did not intend prayer to be the one principle that you obey in life. It is only one principle. There are other principles. There are principles like sowing and reaping. So if you're praying, you will reap in the area of prayer. But if you're not working and you're praying, the Bible says that the person who does not work should not eat. That is as much scripture as prayer at all times. And it has as much power as the other scripture. Mm. See, however powerful, yeah, <laughs> however powerful your prayer is, it will not cook your dinner. Yeah, you have to cook. Likewise, however powerful your prayer is, you cannot close your eyes and walk into the future. We have to plan. Tell your neighbor, we need a plan. Yeah. So we're going to talk a, a little bit in the next few minutes about things that we need to consider to make our latter days better than the former. So, you know, we, we have this thing of saying, my latter days will be better than my former days, than my current days. But what are you doing about it? Because faith without works is dead. We have to do these things. And they are biblical script, um, principles. Okay? So, let's do quick, a quick job here. There are two things that we need to do to make our tomorrow better than today, or at least as good. Number one, you need to make wealth. You can go, I think, to that. And number two, you need to keep wealth. And when I say keep, it's also keep, you also need to transfer wealth to the next generation. So let me put that in there. Can we talk about making wealth? I know that in big service, this is what we concentrate on, and maybe you have heard it until it's coming out of your ears. But it's good to repeat until you start to do the work. Amen? So number one with making wealth is saving, saving, saving. We've gone over this a million times, but unless we are developing a saving culture... While, we were, while you are working, retirement will be hard. Yeah. Find a way to earn. Find a way to save from your earnings. Yeah, find a way. You'll say, I don't earn enough to save. You do. Just split your budget up and put a portion of what you are working aside. It doesn't matter even if it's 10 pounds, get a pound and put it aside. Save. Number two, invest. Find a way for that 
one pound to become one pound fifty. Even if you just take it out of, do you know whether your current account is interest bearing or not? That's a simple thing. Do you know whether your account that you are in has is draw is charging you so that your one pound instead of becoming one pound fifty becomes ninety nine p. Yeah, and then do you know also that one pound this year will, does not have the same value as one pound in three years because of inflation. That is why we keep saying invest, find a way. Okay, if, you, if there's not very much to put, put it in national savings and investments. It's secure. They have good returns. If we're not looking at these things, we're just losing money for free. For free. Those of you that are keeping money under the pillow, in boxes, take that money, put it in national savings, earn a little bit. 4% is good. You get that return and you've not done anything and there are no risks. Invest. Number three, manage debt. Manage debt. Do your best to come out of debt. I speak from experience. Because debt cancels out anything you've done. Uh, to save, to do what, what. If, if the debt is overpowering, there are good debts and there are bad debts. If it's a debt towards investment and you know it's going to work out in the end, that is healthy. But you need to know when, you, when to call the shots. Maybe not go into big debt when we are near retirement. Mm. Manage debt. Number four is get on the property ladder as soon as you possibly can. Why? Because rent will always go up a lot faster than your pensions and your savings. Yes. Find a way to get out of rent. Because your income, now you're paying your rent okay because you're working. But a time is going to come when your income and the rent are not, you know, they're not at par. The, 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 the issue that we have living in England is that rent is one of our biggest expenses, if not the biggest expense. That is why it's good to have, have a cup property or have a plan. Maybe you, you want to stay in rent and retire somewhere else where you can afford to buy a house. Yes, okay, that's a plan. Have a plan concerning that, okay? Um, the next one, have the a pension. Please, have a pension. Andrew spoke on pensions, and I just wanted to say quickly, I'm not a pensions expert, but I know that there are two types of pensions. There's your state pension, and then there is occupational pensions. Okay, the, one of the issues with older people is income. Even those who have property, the issue is cash. So you have people that are property rich and cash poor. So this is why we have to talk about pensions because I may have bought my house, but if I don't have something that's producing income, how am I going to buy food? Okay, let me talk a little bit about state pension. As, well, men and women now are almost on a par. I don't even know why it was an issue that men had a different pension from women. But anyway, he, there you are. State pension. You are entitled, uh, fellow British people, if you're entitled to something, take it. Please. There are very few countries in the world that give free money. And actually, it's not free money because you won't earn it. State pension, you can get up to, the, at the top, 221 pounds, 20 pence, or 21 pence, depending on whether you're male or female. I think there's a difference of 1p. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> Which, 
221 from the state after all my years of working. Okay. A week. That gives you an income of what you mathematicians, like 11,000 per annum. It's not great. I, I, like, I would never take a job for 11,000. But it's something. And when you, if someone gives you 200 pounds a week, it adds up. Okay? But there's a but in there. You can only get that amount if you have been working and paying NI for 35 years. Uh, uh, working and paying NI for 35 years. How many of you think you are going to get there <laughs> by retirement? 35 years of NI. If you are, then that's good because you can get your full state pen pension. So, uh, memo to the younger people, start working early. Yes, and pay an I. Because, yeah, I mean, some people say, I want to work cash in hand. Yeah, I don't want to, people to take my money. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Because by paying, because you're like looking at you, no, why did they take so much? They took it, but it's coming back. They're helping you to save. Okay? Um, for those of you who God has called to sit at home and pray, the issue is <laughs> you need to be doing something while you're sitting at home and praying. I, I, I actually don't understand it very well. Why God would call you to sit at home and pray and also tell you that if you don't work, you don't eat. There are a few tricks here. If you are not in formal employment, you can make voluntary payments to fill the gaps. And that helps to build up um, your, uh, your, how much state pension you'll get at the end of the day. If you cannot afford to pay in NI, claim ES, uh, uh, employment savings, what is it called? ESA or job seekers allowance. Some of you are like, ah, 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 me, I don't like benefits. I don't like benefits, the whole culture of benefits. The truth is, when you're on ESA and Job Seekers Allowance, they will give you credits towards your state pension. So you're not losing time. Have you understood? So some of you will feel like, ah, uh -uh, going to queue there, you're queuing with the guy who's on drugs and whatever. Just swallow your pride for a little bit because you know what you're doing. And you get credits towards the future. You're covering gaps. Tell your neighbor, mind the gap. So when you have gaps, when you have gaps in your um, employment history, it means your state pension is going to be less. So you're making yourself poorer in the future. Have we understood? Mm. You can continue to work while getting pension if you hit pension age. Okay, so let me jump quickly to occupational pensions. I'm not going to say a lot about it. Occupational pension is automatic if you're earning over 10,000 per annum. Yeah? Occupational pensions, your employer contributes and you contribute. So there are two parties in there. The problem with them is you, are, you have an option to opt out. And a lot of people opt out to their peril. If you opt out because you're saying, eh, my kamani, why are they taking this amount? If you, you need it today, but you're not planning for tomorrow. And if you opt out, then you're, you're saving your employer money because they don't have to contribute if you, if you have opted out. Whereas if you opt in, they're taking your kamani, but they're giving you another kamani. Because the truth is, 11,000 
for state pension is not going to be enough. You're going to need a little bit more. So your occupational pension, okay? Um, we don't have the time to go over the different types of pensions. You talked about the, the one where you get the final cash payment. The, it's less common now. The one that we have now is the money purchase scheme. And it depends on what you put in. So what you put in helps it to grow. And it also, unfortunately, depends on how investments are doing. So there's a little bit of risk which is always there with the wealth creation. But let me talk about keeping the wealth. Mm. Let me talk about that quickly. There's this scripture which you should know, commit to, to your heart, is a good man in, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous. I like reading scriptures many times. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. A good man leaves his, an inheritance. So the people who don't leave an inheritance, what are they? Uh, you said it yourself. <laughs> Not just to your children, but the next generation. Yeah, let your next generation give thanks to God that you were clever and you made life easier for them. It makes you good. Mm. This is generic man. Yes, a good man, a good woman. Oh, all you guys who are like, let my husband do it. Uh, uh, uh. There, are four pair, there are four hands in the house. All of us are working to make a good an inheritance. Yeah. God made man. Are, are you in man when God made man? Yes, you are in there. <laughs> the issue is, having made wealth, how do you secure it for the next generation? How do you secure it? And I'm just going to go over a few things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is making a will. Uh, black people do not like talking about making wills. Some of them are like, I'm not old enough. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is old enough? And how do you know how old you will be? Okay, so let me talk about myths. Um, Myths about wills. And I think the first one, okay, let me first, let me go in the order that is there. If you don't make a will, your wealth goes to the crown. Some people say that. It's not true. It's not true. It may be true. It just means, we'll, we'll come to the rest of it, but if you don't make a will, it just means you don't have a say on what happens to your estate when you die. The government dictates that. But it doesn't dictate it that it's going to the crown. It goes along bloodlines and along established family patterns that are in the intestacy rules. That's too technical, but basically just put it in your head if I don't make a will, I don't decide who gets my money. Okay? So, um, you also don't decide in what proportions that money, which you've worked for, goes to. Mm -hmm. Next thing. Making a will does not invite death. Saints, you are not going to die because you wrote a will. <laughs> It does not hasten your death, neither is it a manifestation of a lack of faith. It is called planning. It is not a negative word over your life. The truth is, all of us have an appointment with death. It is a corridor 
that we go through to go to the other life. We all want to be in heaven. We just don't want the corridor which goes there. But the truth is, none of us will live on planet Earth forever. So it is just common sense to plan. It's simply planning for one of life's few certainties. When should you make it? When? Uh -huh. As soon as you have something of value to pass on. As soon as you have something of value to pass on. So, if you bought a house at 22, you make your will at 22. Yeah. It is not an age-related thing. It is wealth-related. Because all you're doing is saying, if I'm not here, I would like this to go to the other person. That's why, as solicitors, Irene will tell you, when you purchase property, the first thing we'll say to you is, do you have a will? Even if you're 22, okay? So it gives you your chance to say who gets what. The other myth is that making a will saves tax. That is a, a myth because it does not necessarily save tax. It's what you do with it. It can be used to save tax. And unfortunately, HMRC is closing up those gaps very quickly. It can be used to save tax. For example, if you give to charity 10% of your estate, then it takes inheritance tax from 40% of your assets above a certain threshold to 36. Okay? And a plug here is one of the greatest ways that you can bless the house of God is give to the house of God in your will. You also help yourself to get a lower tax rate. Think about it. A lot of churches benefit from wills, um, things that are put in wills. Now, another myth Making a will means you don't have to go to probate or go through a probate procedure. That is not true. Whether or not, does anybody understand when I say probate? Okay, so when you die, if you have more than 5,000 in your estate, even if you've written a will, it has to go through a formal court procedure where you're given a grant you have to make sure that you've paid taxes and all of this and you filled in the forms to tell the government how much was in this person's estate then they give you a piece of paper called a grant of probate if you had a will or letters of administration you've had letters of administration some of you they give you that piece of paper to authorize somebody to deal with your estate. No. Well, if you have left less than 5,000, a lot of banks will agree that for a small estate, they will let you use the small estate's procedure. So they'll just make you sign something, you being the beneficiary, not the dead person, <laughs> sign something to, to just um, indemnify the bank and they'll agree to let you have that money because it's small loss for them. Everything else, selling houses, closing bank accounts, closing savings, shares, what, what, you will need a grant. So that is whether or not you died with a will. Okay? The only issue is that it is easier, the process is easier when you have a will because we know who the executors are, the person who's going to do the work. It clarifies... Also things like, you can deal with all sorts of things, where you want to be buried, who you want to look after your children, all those kinds of things. It makes management easier. As for, um, so what, what was that one? Tax, uh, pr probate procedure. Aha, mm. uh -huh. no, let me leave abroad for the last thing. Um, the issue of if you don't have a will, one of the biggest things, problems is that you don't get 
to say who gets what. Now, let me give you one example that is extremely common in black communities, is that um, the, the law says that if you're married and you have children, your wife gets the statutory amount of 322,000 at the moment, plus half of your estate, and then the children get the other half. Now the issue comes with blended families. Your children are not from this wife. You had children before you married. These, or not all your children are from your wife. So now, your estate is 320. The entire thing is going to go to her. And the children get nothing. So it's things like that. Then there are others who say, we are married. But there's no marriage certificate anywhere. You've just always lived together. So we, in law, you're called a cohabitee. As a cohabitee, you can ha have cohabited for 30 years. It doesn't matter. We do not recognize you. Yes. So you, ca you cannot, you don't get anything unless you go to court to fight for your rights. So those are some of the things. Let me leave, leave you the, the, this thing sh soon. Making a will for foreign property abroad does not mean that you will not pay tax here on that property. So some people think, okay, I have land in the UK, I have land in Uganda. We're going to talk about tax for a minute. When you are domiciled in this country, that domicile simply means that the tax office recognizes you as UK rather than Rwanda or Uganda. Hmm? And, and they assume it because a lot of us, we want to say, uh -uh, when it comes to tax, I'm Ugandan. The issue with being, being UK domiciled is that the UK taxes all of your property. All the Ugandan property, the English property, the, we take everything and we put it in one bucket, then we tax on that. Then some people are like, but I made a will in Uganda. It doesn't matter. That determines who's going to get what in Uganda. The tax issue is separate. We will still tax you. You ask me, how will they know? Trust me, they know. The HMRC works very hard to discover these things, and they find them. They find our assets. Banks have rela uh, relationships with each other. They find them. Don't ask me how, but they do. Um, there's also the fact that you're a Christian, so you shouldn't. <laughs> it's a small issue there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, so that's that one of the things about your wealth is you want to make sure your wealth benefits the right people in the right um, proportions, so make a will. I have very little time. I want to just touch a few other things. Some other, so it's, uh, this is under other concepts or something like that. Trusts. Hmm. Um, some people think that if you put a, a something in a trust, that's it. It's out of my estate. Um, I've saved money. It's the answer to all things. Let me just say this about uh, trusts. Trusts can be set up in your lifetime or in a will. So either way. What does a trust mean? Anyone want me to explain that a little bit? Tr a trust basically means that Usually two or more people are holding money on behalf of somebody else or some other people. So it can be me and Irene are trustees. We're holding money for Auntie Jane and Stephen. Okay? So the money does not look like Irene's money or my money. It's in the trust. Okay? So you set them up either lifetime or via a will. Um, the lifetime trusts, there are a number of them, but 
one way of having a trust is a bare trust, which means I, um, Auntie Jane and Stephen, the beneficiaries, are entitled 100% to whatever the trust property is. Now, the issue is that when they die, if Auntie Jane dies and she's the beneficiary of that kind of trust, then that money which is in a trust is in Auntie Jane's estate, even though it was in a trust. There's another type which says the trustees can choose. The beneficiaries are, let me say, Baserwanga. And there are many beneficiaries. And the trustees determine who gets what. So they can give this one 10, they give 20. Now with those ones, because it doesn't go into the estate of any of the beneficiaries, when you set it up in life, you have to pay tax. Inheritance tax, 20%. Yeah. And the problem with the inheritance, with those ones, they're called interesting possession trusts, is you do not pay tax once. You keep paying. You pay an amount on setup, you pay an amount every 10 years, and you pay an amount when the trust comes to an end. I'm just showing you that trusts are not necessary. They're complex. You need advice on them. Okay? You can set up a trust in the will. And, and some people think that this is to help to save taxes. Um, but it, they're very, very, very few tax evading. Is that the right word? Um, options now in a will. With, with trusts. But trusts can be useful. Let me give you one very useful uh, way of, of trusts. In your will, if you've got a disabled beneficiary who is needing social services, benefits, social care, all of that, you do not do that child as favor by giving them an inheritance in your will outright. Why? Because when you do that, the money that they get from an inheritance will wipe out their benefits. So you've taken them backwards instead of forwards. So what people do is if you've got that kind of a beneficiary, you need to make sure that you've put a certain kind of trust in your will. So you can put their amount in what's called a disabled person's trust. So it, that way, it's, they are shielded from the money going to them directly. So that's one of the useful things about trusts. Let me talk quickly about gifts. Because, um, so you're thinking, let me backtrack. One of the issues that we have is that we do have a very high inheritance tax rate in this country. 325,000 comes to you tax-free of your estate. Everything above that is taxed at 40%. And we're talking about everything. Your land, those properties, what, what. The land in Uganda. Ti, 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 ti. We put all of it together. We take out expenses. And then the rest, if you're above 325000 we tax at 40%. And the other issue is you have to pay a large portion of that 40% tax before they give you the other paper, I was talking about the probate paper. So you can't say, I will sell one of my houses and then get the money to pay the inheritance tax. Uh -uh. You need the paper to allow you to sell the house. So you need to have paid inheritance tax first. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. So... The, I put that on A or B at the end, but it's important. Let me give you a quick story. I once acted for, uh, I think it's okay to say, a Jamaican gentleman who had nine properties in the United Kingdom. Isn't that a wealthy person? We were stuck dealing with his estate for years, and his beneficiaries suffered. Why? Because he was property rich, rich, but cash. We could not find the cash to pay the tax. 
and we can't sell our house to pay that tax because we need that paper to sell the house. So we were stuck. We had to go from family to family who are beneficiaries. Guys, can you lend us money? Now, because you have nine properties, you are talking about a lot of money. We went to banks saying, give us a bridging loan. The money is there. It's their properties here. They're like, we don't like bridging loans. So if, you're, if you have a lot of property, I beg, take out an insurance for inheritance tax. Yes. So that you have cash. There is cash available to your beneficiaries to pay that tax. Thank me later. <laughs> Let me talk quickly about gifts, and then we'll be done. Gifts, because some people are like, ah, ah, for me these inheritance taxes, ah, ah, I'll just put my house or my houses in the name of my children. Yeah, so it's not in my name. When I die, it's going to the children. Okay, so there are a few issues with gifts. Number one, if you give a gift... It's not yet out of your estate. You need seven years. You need to survive seven years after you've given that gift for it to completely fall out of your estate. Number two, if you give the gift but you're getting a benefit, for example, a common thing that people do is that they put the house in the name of their children. Then they live in the house. Now, you, that house is still in your estate. <laughs> For purposes of tax, we will, not we will count it. We'll count the value of it. Unless there are ways around it in the house. If you live there and you're paying rent, da da da, and they're also living there with you, there, there, there are ways around it. But you can't just say that I've given it away. You need to look and see, have I reserved a benefit? You give away the buy-to-let property, you put it in the name of Marvin, and then the rent comes to me. The HMRC says, nah, <laughs> sorry, we see you. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> I'm finishing. <laughs> We need to finish. So there's a lot to think about. And if we just close our eyes and live, we end up paying too much tax, thinking that we've done something wise when we've not done something, doing our children disservices by giving them money when we should have put it in a trust. All these kind of things are things we need to think about before. Let me do one bonus thing, and then we shall have a few seconds to for, for questions. Lasting powers of attorney. We always recommend that when you're doing a will, you do a lasting power of attorney. What is a lasting power of attorney? It is a document that appoints somebody to look after your affairs, and you can have it either dealing with your property affairs or dealing with um, your health and welfare. But we're talking about property because this is a business service. You can have a, last, a lasting power of attorney authorizes somebody to look after your affairs if something happens to you. Yeah? Now, I know we are people of faith. But the truth is, to plan, there's a, there's a saying there, something. It is, there's nothing that, a, like a, it's not a lack of faith to plan, okay? So sometimes you might have a situation that knocks you out for a, a month. If you were not there, Jonah, for a month, would the family be able to access your things? Would they be able to run the things or would they be stuck until you are better? So that, that lasting power of attorney, the thing is, it doesn't, you don't lose control. Because while you're capacitated, it's fine. You can choose not to let them 
do anything while you're capacitated. But the moment you're incapacitated, as long as you've registered it, it starts to work. So it's a good document to have because, unfortunately, stuff happens. Yeah, I'm done. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions you would like to ask? <laughs> Where do we start? Pastor T. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to ask if I was to do a will here, mm. do I need to do another will for Uganda, for instance? Yes, good question. I would suggest very strongly, we always suggest that if you've got mom money, in another jurisdiction, please do a will in that jurisdiction. Why? I've already explained that it's not got anything to do with the taxes. It has got a lot to do with the law of that land. So each land has its own succession acts. Yeah? Some, some of you have property in France, in wherever, wherever. Those people have different rules about succession. And some of their succession rules are nothing like ours. So your will may not, be, may not have the impact that you wanted it to have in Uganda. So that's why we always say have a will in the jurisdiction that, um, that you have property. subject to another tax regime in Uganda. Do you know or would it be... Usually, double, double usually, usually they speak to each other about those taxations so their understandings that is more like an accountant's thing but there, there usually is a way that you can make sure that you're not being double taxed. But the will itself is not what determines that. Yeah, the will just determines where things go. Thank you very much, Pastor Chris. I think we need you back. Just one question. If I don't have 5,000 pounds as savings, mm. I have no property, I have nothing of value, mm. how can I start writing a will? The issue is, do you know whether at the point of your death you will have nothing of value? That's the thing. I think... I'll, I'll give you my experience. Some of the most tricky estates that we deal with are lower value estates because the person thinks, I have no money. But then at the end of their life, there's a, an a account that has accumulated. There's this, that, and the other. And you end up with like a thousand pounds that's sitting there that we don't know what to do with because it's a thousand pounds more or we don't know who their relatives are who can take out less letters of administration. So it's always wise, because you don't know what the end will look like. M Ma, sorry, mine is not a question, but it's a about the thought that you have nothing of value. I've had people who, when someone has passed away, they've had, they were fighting over the scarves of yes. their mom, or things, uh, possessions, necklaces, yes. jewelry. So it's impossible to think that you have nothing of value. And what people will find very valuable when you're gone. Yes. It could and be a picture, it could be anything. Yeah. You know. And then the other thing was, I forgot to say, we had a case in the Ugandan community of a funeral which was stopped for six months, seven months, all about where to bury. Because of failing to clarify. The fam family is saying Uganda. The wife is saying he told me UK. They stuck for six months and paying the undertaker. <laughs> so last one. The last question. Um, how, how different is it if you're married and if you're single um, in terms of if you've got a will and you know, lasting powers of attorney and all that? 
I think I need a whole day to talk to you and say get married. Because um, the spouse exemption, assets that pass between spouses pass tax-free. Okay? So, it is actually good for you to be married. The other thing is sometimes it's better for you to have assets in joint. For example, if my estate with, with Lincoln, everything is joint, we don't need the other caprobate paper because joint assets pass to the survivor without probate. Get married. <laughs> thank you, Pastor Grace. That was a really good word, and thank you for the understanding. Thank you for everyone who came today. Um, I hope you understood and got something from it today. Um, there's refreshments in the canteen. Thank you.